The Oscar goes to Black Panther Wakanda Forever, Ruth Carter. looking at uh, the indigenous tribes of Africa, and in this case, we, um, we were inspired by Mayan culture, and um, so that makes it really exciting to go down new, uh, new frontiers and, and retrain the uh, standards of beauty, to see beauty differently. Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Post Live and another in our series on race in America giving voice. Co-produced with the Capehart Podcast, I am Jonathan Capehart, Associate Editor at the Washington Post. From the scorching bright clothing of Do the Right Thing to the vibrant African aesthetics across Black Panther and Black Panther Wakanda Forever, my guest today has created some of the most recognizable costumes in Hollywood over the last three decades. They earned her two Academy Awards for Best Costume Design, the first black woman to ever win in that category in 2011. And when she won again in 2022, Carter became the first black woman ever to win two Oscars. Her new book, The Art of Ruth E. Carter, Costuming His Black History and the Afro Future from Do the Right Thing to Black Panther, takes us inside how some of her iconic looks came to life. And joining me now is Ruth E. Carter. Ms. Carter, welcome to Cape Heart on Washington Post Live. Hello, it's wonderful uh, to be here. It's uh, been a long uh, career uh, and a wonderful opportunity to, to produce a book that uh, people can read about some of the experiences that I've had mm -hmm. along the way. Well, an incredible career, but you started out wanting to be an actress, and it, it, but you write that after co uh, costuming plays, you became the de, de facto costume designer for all of Hampton University. How did that period shape your creativity? And how did you go from being an actress to costume design in the first place? Well, let's not think of uh, it as though I was an actress on the Broadway stage. I was an actress. I was a thespian in college, and I loved the theater. Um, it was a, a, a place of, um, of cathartic uh, experience for me. I was a special education major when I started, and the theater was a place that I um, found a home in where I loved to perform and and uh, get into characters. And so it was an extracurricular activity for me, the acting part, and that I enjoyed. Um, mm -hmm. But little did I realize that I was going to start to take the theater uh, uh, major more seriously. And I changed from special education to theater arts um, uh, my sophomore year. Mm -hmm. And and that uh, blossomed. And one time I auditioned for a play and I didn't make the part. And I went to the professor's office to ask him, you know, what happened? Because I thought I was pretty good as an actress, you know. And uh, he says, well, we don't have anyone to do the costumes. Do you want to uh, try it? And I thought, okay, you know, the consolation prize. But what I realized when I opened the door to the little costume shop at Hampton University, and there was really no one occupying that space, it became a learning lab for me. And I realized that I could explore all the characters and not just one. Mm -hmm. and, and just to be clear, um, it's not like he said, hey, design the costumes, and that was your first time ever dealing with fabric and patterns and sewing machines and, and scissors and things. Like you, were all, you had already been doing that um, growing up. Uh, 
I, I, there was a sewing machine in my bedroom, but it looked like a desk. Uh, it was my mom's sewing machine and I was drawing on that desk, you know, growing up. And then one day I opened the big leaflet top and inside, lo and behold, was a sewing machine. Uh, and in the little drawers, there were singer patterns and I just decided to create with this sewing machine. I, I didn't have like Barbie dolls and things like that to make clothes for. So I just experimented with uh, my own clothes and, and redesigned, you know, my jean jacket and, or, mm -hmm. or a skirt into something else. So that was the, the, that was the beginning of it all. And so, so then Ms. Carter, was it dif a, a difficult, was it difficult, um, mm -hmm to move from working on costumes in theater shops to working on film sets? Oh, yes, it's a huge difference. Um, but my foundation in the costume shops and theater um, helped me tremendously to focus on what the differences were between theater and film and what the similarities were um, the aesthetic distance is one of them. You know, when you're in a live uh, show, a theater, um, there is a whole spectacle on stage that's um, that's transformative, and and the play goes from start to finish. Um, with movies, it's all segmented. You shoot the beginning, and then you shoot the end, and then you shoot the middle, and uh, that that really takes you understanding the flow, the acts, the different acts and um, the arcs, the, everything that goes into what uh, creates the story. And that foundation I got in theater. The difference is that with film, you see everything up close. So there's, um, there's a lot of detail that you can actually add to your costumes or the look of the production. With uh, theater, those details are lost. The aesthetic di distance you, doesn't allow you to see a lot of details. So there's a different, definitely a gentler approach to uh, filmmaking, uh, the filmmaking costume, co process of costume design. So I want to borrow a line, the very first line in the foreword of your book um, that was written by Denai Gurira. And I know I mispronounced yep. her last name, but it's a difficult she, one. Her first line is, I knew her before I ever met her. And, and that jumped out at me and resonates with me because, yeah, yeah, you did Black Panther, you did Black Panther Wakanda Forever and Do the Right Thing and all these great movies. But to mm -hmm. me, the greatest movie you did was your very first movie, School Days. Oh, School it Days. Is the one it is the one Spike Lee movie I have watched definitely more than once and certainly more than 10 times. Um, talk about that moment, because when you write about it, like you really put a lot of faith in this young up and coming film director who called you up on the phone. You, If I remember right, you were living in Los Angeles. He calls you up and says, I want you to work on, on my uh, movie come to yes. New York, uh, yes. you went to your brothers mm -hmm. and he guided you on how to come up with and how to come up with the presentation for what you yes. were gonna present to Spike Lee for what became one of the most iconic films uh, in his portfolio that I think gets overlooked on, of all the things he's done. Talk about school days and how important that was to you. Oh, well, you know, we were all, if you would say, up and coming. Uh, that was the one person we knew in film, uh, Spike, and he graduated from NYU Film School. And so he was our fearless leader. We, re we really relied on him to give us the guidance that we needed to do a movie. And so I was excited. Um, and I'd gone to an HBCU. I went to Hampton. He went to Morehouse. And there were many of us. Robbie Ree casting uh, went to Hampton with me. We had we were a film family from the start. It 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 became um, us real uh, recreating what we had experienced in college, and and so that part of it 
was kind of like the easy part, you know, when we thought about, you know, what would our, our, our pledges look like? What would the gamma rays look like? What would the fellows look like? You know, and, and uh, Spike uh, guided us with that, you know, uh, uh, Lawrence Fishburne played DAP and he had a die fest, uh, South Africa t-shirt on and he was the militant and Samuel Jackson was one of the local yokels with the jerry mm -hmm. curl and, and, and the, uh, the shower cap on his head. And then we had Giancarlo Esposito and he was, uh, he was the leader of Gamma Phi Gamma, the fraternity. And at that time, there were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of companies that were willing to support uh, young filmmakers like Spike Lee. So we had Nike and uh, so many other um, people that came in and gave us like uh, bags and book bags and all kinds of stuff. So we were supported as this little tribe of, of young filmmakers that were creating a story about their own experiences in college. And yet it did have this, this undertone, this little dark undertone, you know, with the gamma rays really wanting to, you know, make their mark with the gammas and, and uh, we really did have a lot of fun. And I think that that film stands the test of time because it was done with so much heart. It was done with so much promise and hope for, for our future. It, it is truly, it is a terrific film. Also, you know, to go back to that line, I knew her before meeting you. I knew her before I met her. That movie, those costumes, um, leave aside what they were talking about in the arc of the film, but it is something even watching it, what, three decades later, I know those people and I know yes. that I know the fashion. Um, mm -hmm. In reflecting on your time, particularly um, with Spike, um, uh, you write in the book, I knew I could not only design costumes, but also express the heart and soul of black people, their culture, their nuances, my personal experiences as a black woman and the character details I found the most interesting. Talk more about how film allows you to convey the, the complexity of the black American experience. Well, just like you said, you know, when you looked at the film, you said, I know those people. And even today, it's still relevant. And, you know, Do the Right Thing is in the Library of Congress. You can watch it today and you, and you, and you feel like it's still relevant. And, you know, when I uh, first got into uh, costuming, I wanted to work for the uh, Negro uh, Ensemble Company in New York City because they were doing some really powerful plays that talked about culture. When I went to the Schomburg Center for Research in New York uh, when I was uh, researching for Malcolm X, and I saw all of these photographers and their images of Black people in Harlem in the 1940s and the 1920s. And I, I too felt like I know these people, you know, you see the faces, you, the, the decades might change the costumes and the clothing, you know, still rings a familiarity to you, the faces, especially. So if I do a film like Rosewood or Baby Boy, I feel like I'm creating a part of culture that will stand the test of time, that these people um, are not unlike those who we knew, uh, those of our past, those of our present, and, and those of our future. So there is a connection that I think you feel when you look at the experiences and the, um, you know, the iconic um, um, occurrences like the Selma March, you know, there is something that you sense that you want to really bring to the screen when you're creating costumes. Well, speaking of the Selma March and also Malcolm X, Selma March um, is an historic event. Malcolm X is an historic figure. When you're costuming an historical figure like Malcolm X or John Lewis and the, and, uh, and the Selma Marchers, how do you balance the aesthetic of what historical figures were photographed wearing and your interpretation mm -hmm. of what you think they would wear. 
Well, there's uh, two. It's twofold. You do want to replicate the research exactly. I'm, I, you know, it's not unlike me to be on set with my research, with my photographs, and comparing what we are presenting to what was there. We're constantly surrounded by research when we're getting background dressed, when we're talking to sometimes the descendants of the march, you know, or people who were there when they were children. Um, uh, in, on, at the march and they're telling us about their experiences. And then there are those occasions when you are, uh, you don't have the reference. So the research that you do about the person um, with Malcolm X, I went to the Department of Corrections and I asked to see his files um, that he had when he was in, imprisoned in Massachusetts. And I read all of his letters that he wrote to the uh, commissioner to get uh, transferred to other prisons that had better libraries. I, I saw his medical records. I, I, I did so much research and reading. I felt like there was a tone and a tone to him and that I could make some decisions on, you know, what he might wear in those times where we had no research to actually uh, compare it to. Mm. You know, and this is a great segue to an audience question that we have from Sue Ann Strom from Kansas. And she asks, what is your process for designing clothes for a movie? Do you research the story of the movie? So you just told us about your process of researching Malcolm X. But mm -hmm. what about, say, uh, Black Panther? How do you go about researching um, a storyline like Black Panther and then using that story and making costumes for the, yes. for the actors to wear? Well, you do uh, go back to the comics. Uh, you are ha in conversation with the director. Um, we are, we were examining Afro future, but you could see that in the comics that were done so long ago in the 1960s by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, that there was this Wakanda that was a melting pot of tribes. And, you know, those little comic boxes that where they painted all of these characters as you, as you, uh, as you thumb through the comics and, and some of it was written more contemporary, you know, Tanahashi Tana Coates and, and others. Reggie Hudlin, they all have their versions of Black Panther. But one thing that stayed constant was that it was this melting pot of tribes. It was this place that was a pre-colonization. And with that information, we decided to select 12 tribes that we researched in depth and come up with these illustrations that, that depicted their culture, their culture of uncolonization, of honoring their tribal elders, of honoring their their history, but also bringing it into the Afro future, infusing technology and becoming very modern, modernized with the look. So when you combine all of those elements together, they kind of show you all the possibilities that you can explore. So we explored 3D printing when we when we made the Queen's crown, which is called an Ishikolo, the uh, the South African married woman's hat. So we 3D printed it, and that way we combined the technology, the tradition, um, to show that Wakanda was uh, in Africa. It was forward thinking. It, it had the latest technology, but it also honored their culture. And so, you know, Afrofuturism, I was going to ask you, ask you about that. When you, did you know what that was or have a grasp of what that was before you started working on Black Panther? And how did it evolve as you worked on the film, as you did your research and you, as you started designing? Well, you know, um, it, it's, uh, it's multi-layered. Uh, I think in the 80s, we called it Neo Soul. Uh, in the 60s, maybe it was, you know, Black Power. Um, I feel that, you know, I had a, um, a an upbringing in Afrofuture in that we were always thinking about, you know, uh, Kwanzaa or bringing in our, our history, uh, knowing our history. And so coming into a film like Black Hip, Black Black Panther, you do have a base that you're working from. Um, Afro Future was coming into vogue. Uh, I remember during my interview with Ryan Coogler, I showed him a lot of 
of images that I had collected around the internet and of these beautiful dark hues with beautiful color and um, how it related to culture in an indirect way and it was still fashionable. And he had some of the same images. And so I think that when we are in our community, we are um, concerned and interested in knowing our history. So we don't start from uh, zero when we go into Afro future. We are starting from a place of knowledge. And that's, that's the one thing that I think really uh, resonated with me in that we were meeting each other for the first time, myself, Ryan Coogler, Nate Moore, Hannah Beekler. We were coming together to do this, this picture, this beautiful uh, tableau of, of African culture. And we all really came to the table with, with uh, a love for it. And, and a base, you know, a family base. And mm -hmm. so we could springboard and create more Afrofuture images. So let's talk a little bit of process. How do mm -hmm. you use, um, well, do you use mood boards and collages uh, as, part of, as part of your process? How do they help? Well, that's the thing. Not everyone on your team um, has an awareness of um, Afrofuture or African culture. And so you have to create a, ro a roadmap for everyone. You have to create references so that um, if someone needs to understand things better, or understand how things are worn or what some fabrications are, a lot of your team are expert at you know aging and dyeing or uh, fabric sourcing. And so they need to understand what's in your head. They need to understand what the story is supposed to look like. And the collages and the mood boards, I mean, we do dozens and dozens of them and they're huge and they're all over the walls in our, in our studio. And they're uh, very st strategic and you can actually walk through the film uh, uh, with these mood boards and you understand exactly um, what we're trying to achieve. So it's very important for the creation of the of the film. I have another uh, uh, audience question to sort of broaden that aperture of our conversation. This comes from Austin Gray from California, who asks, do you think Black artists receive enough recognition? How can we elevate the history of Black women in the film industry? Well, that's a good question. Uh, elevating the history of Black women in the film industry is something that well, you know, we do have to uh, take charge of. Um, you know, you just were heartbroken this year when you saw Angela Bassett uh, not win for Best Supporting. And and you wonder why um, is this happening? Because you saw the performances. And so, you know, how do we elevate? How do we uh, shed, shed that light. Um, I think it's it's multidimensional. We have to continue to tell these stories. We have to continue to cast in this way. Um, you know, there are several uh, there are several vehicles that um, that celebrate Black women, and we have to make sure that we support the NAACP Image Awards. We have to make sure we support. Uh, the films that um, highlight the um, experiences uh, that are being portrayed in these films. We have to support the films, we have to support the celebration, and we have to continue to be a part of this industry, become the writer that writes the story that of the, of the subject that you want to see. I, as you can tell, I could talk to you for a full hour, but we've got about like five minutes left. And I want to I want to squeeze um, some other some other things in. One, what does it mean to you to um, know and have the Black Panther costume being one of several objects from the film that resides at the National Museum of African American History and Culture um, that we see it the, uh, there, the um, Afro Futurism exhibit. Well, I'm very proud to have been a part of uh, the the film. Um, I'm very proud to be a part of the Marvel family. Um, it's an honor to uh, create something for a community that was in need of a superhero. 
And um, there are a lot of uh, collaborators and people involved in creating those costumes. And I'm honored that I was the one who took the helm and, uh, and brought these images to life. All right, I'm just gonna tell the control room. We're, we're gonna go a little over because I've got to get these, these last two questions in. The first one, this right. year marks the 50th anniversary of hip hop, which blows my mind that it's 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, when you started out, the genre was still in its infancy. It, you've played a major part in bringing its, its aesthetic to the big screen. How did you think you, how do, did you think your work played, did it play a role? in hip hop being more widely embraced? Oh yeah, um, I went back and forth between New York and uh, Los Angeles for, oh what, 15, 20 years. I worked with John Singleton, I worked with Spike Lee. Um, going back and forth uh, like that really did put hip hop right front and center. Um, I, I, I worked with Mos Def in, um, uh, bamboozled with Spike Lee uh, in the early days. Uh, we uh, worked in uh, L.A. I put Chris Rock in, you know, Cross Colors. I mean, there were so many uh, emerging designers that, you know, coincided with what was emerging in music. And I think that uh, as filmmakers, uh, Spike Lee, Robert Townsend, Keenan Ivory Wayans, I, we were all at the precipice of this new found uh, culture that was, you know, taking charge. I mean, people were were destroying the the music, uh, hip hop in the beginning, you know, the cassettes were being burned outside of churches. I mean, I remember that happening in New York and, and uh, it was not embraced, but it was embraced by us. Um, so, you know, that was a really wonderful time. I remember not only was uh, was it hip hop, it was neo soul and and uh, you know, it just felt very real and very much alive and very much a voice. I mean, when you look at Public Enemy and their song Fight the Power opens up Do the Right Thing. Um there there you know, there was a voice that we were embracing and I think we were the new generation. Um, it, there are some actors who who you've worked with on many films. Eight mm -hmm. with Eddie Murphy, seven yeah. with Samuel L. Jackson, six yeah. with Angela Bassett. The question is, mm -hmm. how does working with actors again and again impact the costumes you design for them? Yeah, you know, there's a shorthand. Um, when you first work with them, you don't know what they're going to expect. Uh, you don't know how your relationship is going to play out. And when it plays out well, you're invited back to the table. And the next time you work with them and the next time you work with them, you understand their process more. You understand that Samuel L. Jackson loves to uh, work with the costume. And I have created some unusual things for him, like an old boy. And I've done some, you know, silly things like in Do the Right Thing on Samuel Jackson. And, you know, I've done some chic looks on him in Mo Better Blues. And he loves the costumes. And so knowing that about an actor before they get there, you know how to prepare the room. You know what, what kind of fun you're going to have. You know how much time to put in place for them them. You know that after an hour, they'll still be down to trying on more things. And, and that's across the board. Um, Angela Bassett, uh, you can see her thinking in, in the fitting room. It's a transformative uh, process for her. Um, she's very trusting and she will see what you have. She will wear it and she looks at it and you can see her mind thinking about her character and how she'll hold her body in this costume. So when you know that you can explore with them like that, then you are free to be creative. And that's the real wonderful thing about uh, working with an actor over and over and over again. I want to squeeze in one more. It's a battle between two really <laughs> good questions, but we are out of time. So I'll, I'll, I'll end with the simpler one. What's one okay. film that you loved making the costumes for that you think gets overlooked? Oh, Sparkle. Oh my oh. goodness, Sparkle. Um, the creative element of Sparkle, 
the wonderful casting. I had so much fun working with Mike Epps and, and it was like I was doing the Supremes. I was able to explore fashion and do Rudy Gernrich and um, also examine the 60s. And uh, the actors were really excited about the costumes as well. So they, we were all very much in support of each other. And it was a really fun, I can watch that film over and over and again. And it, and it really didn't do that well in the bat box office, but I thought it was fun to do and it looked amazing. Fabulous costumes and it, and even you know equally fabulous soundtrack as as well. <laughs> Ruth E. Carter, two-time Oscar winning uh, author of The Art of Ruth E. Carter Costuming Black History and the Afro Future from Do the Right Thing to Black Panther. I could talk to you all day. Thank you so much for coming to Capehart on Washington Post Live. Thanks for having me. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. To check out what interviews we have coming up, head to WashingtonPostLive.com. Once again, I'm Jonathan Capehart, Associate Editor at The Washington Post. Thanks for watching Capehart on Washington Post Live.